Greetings, everyone. Rob Chastner here, continuing in our study of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, verse by verse. And so if you're following along, you'd want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, we'll cover the first eight verses in this uh, study today. <clears throat> as you remember, and as we finished uh, the last study, chapter 23, we had the final dispute between uh, Jesus and the Jewish leaders. There were three groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Herodians, where Jesus called them hypocrites. He called them morons and false teachers. It was an intense series of arguments, and now Jesus is done with them. He's no longer speaking words of salvation to these leaders, but rather he's speaking words of condemnation. And Jesus will no longer be reaching out to these religious leaders throughout the balance of this book of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. What Matthew shows us is that from chapter 24 moving forward, uh, that Jesus is totally focused on teaching the 12 disciples who will be left behind after the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. Understand that there is no time elapse elapsing between chapters 23 and chapter 24. Um, the arguments have come to an end uh, when we finish chapter 23. And so now we begin with chapter 24, that Jesus went out and he departed from the temple. Remember that the arguments between Jesus and the religious leaders took place inside the temple complex. It's now at an end. Jesus is washing his hands of those religious leaders, and now they're leaving the temple, the, Jesus and the 12 disciples. We read there that the disciples came to him and called his attention to the temple building, the actual structure, likely that there was something exciting uh, in the temple or, or as they were exiting, there's something that catches the eyes of the disciples about the building structure. And Mark's gospel of this same event tells us that uh, the disciples seem to be focused on the stone masonry work. Uh, they must have been focused on something having to do with the stones. Uh, it might have been the ornateness of the stones or the carvings uh, in the stone. And it could have been something like the size of each block of stones which were being used. But there was something there about the stones which greatly impressed them. And that's where we begin in this study verse uh, in chapter 20, 24. So uh, I'm putting the ver verses in the little box below the video if you don't have your Bibles with you. Uh, so press pause and read verses 1 and 2 and then press play again. The magnificence of this building, the temple, would, would be difficult for us to imagine. The main temple complex was under construction for some 46 years. The rest of the complex was under construction for another 36 years. Jewish tradition tells us that during that construction time of this facility that it never rained one time in Jerusalem during the day when they were working on the structure. The, the rain only came in the evening, the nighttime after the workday was complete. And so if one believes Jewish tradition, this would be a real miracle that it didn't rain for uh, uh, 82 years during the daytime. Herod the Great was the one who was responsible for this building, the building of the temple. Herod was a master builder. Uh, he was also an egomaniac. He stood about four and a half feet tall. Very small guy, but he had a very large ego. And it was his desire that his buildings would be so magnificent that his name would go on the lips of mankind uh, for centuries to come. And it actually worked because right here in this study today, 21 centuries later, or 20 centuries later, uh, we're still talking about Herod the Great. Um, uh, there are many archaeologists who believe that if the timeline of the first century would have been included when they put together that list of seven wonders of the world, uh, that this structure, the temple, would have been part of that, uh, that list of the wonders of the world. Um, um, 
Josephus tells us, first century historian, uh, in the 18th year of Herod's reign, he threw himself into this task, this uncommon task to reconstruct the temple of God by his own means, greatly increasing his precincts and raising it to a more worthy height. He planned this as his most significant deed, uh, as it was to act as, an, as his eternal memorial, end of quote. Herod set out for this structure to be the crown jewel of everything which he built. He desired that this temple would outlive the pyramids in Egypt. Now it was a magnificent structure. Josephus tells us that some of the blocks of stone were 64 feet long, 10 feet high, and 12 feet deep or thick. If you can imagine this, you're talking about the surface or the size of a of a mobile home, a single wide mobile home. Some of these stones weighed in excess of 400 tons. How they moved them from one position to another was an incredible feat. And the craftsmanship was so detailed. You know, imagine a piece of stone 64 feet long, 12 feet thick, and you chisel, uh, all you have is your chisel and your hammer. You make it smooth. You lay the one block on top of the other. You don't use any mortar joints. Uh, it snapped into place like a puzzle. And it was such a tight fit that you could walk around the perimeter of the 64 foot stone and put your knife into the seam and it wouldn't fit. It wouldn't penetrate because they were so tightly put together. Josephus tells us that with this white limestone, which they used, if you're walking toward Jerusalem from several, several miles away, an unsuspecting viewer would look up at Mount Moriah where the structure was, the mountain which Jerusalem was, uh, was built on top of, and it looked like it was snow. But as you get closer, you would realize that it was not snow, but it was this massive limestone structure that Herod was building there. Along top uh, of this structure was a golden crown. And again, Josephus tells us that when the sun was ri rising or setting, uh, there was such a brilliant reflection off of this golden crown that you would actually have to turn your eyes away so as not to have the blinding light. Now imagine what it was like for the disciples as they were walking out of this incredible structure, all of a sudden, I uh, have Christ say, take a good look here, fellas, because this deal is going to be torn down block by block. Now, what in the world happened? After 30 years uh, uh, from this event that we're talking about in this study, the Jews rebelled against the Roman rule. In response to that, Rome sent the general Titus uh, and four legions uh, uh, and and they laid siege upon the city of Jerusalem. It appears that Titus was a nice guy, an okay guy. Uh, he, he was not bloodthirsty. He offered the Jews many times just to surrender, uh, to have a bloodless conflict. Titus offered them just surrender, open the gates, pay your taxes to Rome, and uh, me and the boys will get out of your hair. And you can get you know, back to your life as normal. Time and again, the Jews refused. At one point, Titus said, when you eventually, when we eventually breach the city walls, which we will do, there is going to be carnage. We will destroy the city, men, women, children. And so to keep that from happening, I will back my army off uh, to a safe distance away from the city. The fighting men came, you know, can come down from Jerusalem or out of Jerusalem uh, take as much time as you need to build your defenses as you deem necessary. And then at your signal, we will engage in battle. And thereby, we will save all of your men, all, all of your women, and all of your children from bloodshed. And yet the, the Jews refused the offer that was sent from Titus. Finally, he throws his hands up in the air, and Titus says, I, I am not found guilty before God. What is about to happen is not going to be on my head, but rather... It's going to be on the head of the Jews. Now, just before they were getting ready to breach the walls, they knew that the high value target was the temple that Herod built. 
what are we going to do with that temple? Josephus tells us, again, this is a quote, his generals came together and they discussed what they should do with the temple. Some wanted to destroy it because it uh, gave the Jews a reason for uprising. Others argued that if the Jew, the Jews would not, would clear out of the temple, it should be allowed to stand. But if it was used as a fortress, then it should be destroyed. Uh, Titus then gave the command that uh, whatever happened, that the temple was to be spared because it was always, uh, it would always be a, a great tribute to the empire. And three of the chief generals had agreed and the meeting was disbanded, end of quote. So Titus, Titus's command was to leave the temple intact no matter what happens. And so they, they breached the city walls, and sure enough, the Jews inside of the temple complex, uh, they, they ran into the, the complex for the last stand. Um, and um, uh, they, they encamped in the, around the, the holy house. But as far as that house, God doomed it uh, to the fire long before, and now the fatal day had come. And it was the ninth day of the month of Av on the Hebrew calendar, the very same day on the Hebrew calendar where the Babylonians came in and destroyed Solomon's temple uh, some 856 years earlier. Um, uh, that is not a coincidence. Uh, it was in the hand of God and fulfilling the prophecy here that Jesus spoke. Uh, what happened was some someone started a fire in the wood structure uh, of the temple. Uh, it began to burn so intensely that the golden crown above the top of the temple began to melt. The gold began to run down the sides of these huge blocks and began to seep inside of the joints all around the temple. Now understand that the Roman soldiers also paid uh, they were paid not only a salary, but they were paid by the spoils of war. And the more gold which you found, the bigger paycheck you're going to get. And so in order for these guys to get paid as much as they, they could, uh, it was necessary for them to actually take apart the building block by block and get all of that gold that seeped down into each of the, the seams between those big blocks of stone. And so the they stormed the temple. They destroyed the temple. It was not Titus that wanted this to happen. In fact, when Titus had a friend congratulate him on his victory, this is in history books, Titus said, there is no merit in vanquishing a people who are forsaken by their own gods. And so Titus, he understood, he knew the God of the Jews uh, had turned his back on his people. And as a result, this prophecy we're reading about uh, in Matthew chapter 24 is a fulfillment of what Christ had, had expressed. Now, you have, to, uh, you have to put yourself into the position of the disciples who are right there. Uh, you know, they're in their right mind. Uh, they would say, well, who in the world would ever tear down such a structure as this temple? You could turn this into a temple of, to a pagan god. You could turn this into an office complex. You could turn it into a palace for some king. Uh, um, why would anybody want to destroy this? And so now Christ is leaving the temple. He's, he's leaving the city of Jerusalem. He's going over to the Mount of Olives with his 12 disciples to stay in the city of, or this little village of Bethany for the night. And he's within 48 hours of his own death. And now these disciples are attempting to figure out how is this place going to be destroyed? And they think that they've figured it out. And so now the disciples begin to ask Jesus uh, three questions. All right, so now press pause, read verse three, and then come back. The first question, the temple is going to be destroyed. When will these things happen? Then they ask, what will be the sign of your coming? Now, the word coming there in the Greek is parousia. Uh, parousia, it's concordance number 3952. It means advent. It means unveiling. When are you going to establish or show us your kingdom? And finally, the third question, when are you going to, when is there going to be the end of the world? And so 
in the way of the thinking of the disciples, the only way that the temple is going to be destroyed is going to happen from the world ending. It was so magnificent that the only way that it could be torn down is if the end of the world. So they're asking, when is the end of the world coming? Notice that Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and that is where the sermon was given, uh, uh, known as the Olivet Discourse, or the sermon which took place on the Mount of Olives. Now, this is the second longest recorded sermon of Christ. The longest sermon that took place of Christ was, of course, the Sermon on the Mount, which was in chapters uh, covered in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. And so the two longest recorded sermons of Jesus took place on the sides of mountains. Notice this is a private sermon. This is not given to the general public. This is between Jesus and the 12 disciples. Jesus now answers them. All right, press pause, read verses 4 and 5, and then press play again. Isn't it interesting that the number one sign that we should look for regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to be spiritual deception. Spiritual deception. Notice that he says many will come, and then notice many will be deceived. A very scary thought. Now, he not only uses this as the first sign, but this is going to be the only sign that Jesus will restate later in his sermon. He's going to talk about war. He's going to talk about famine, earthquakes, but he's not going to come back to those uh, items and restate them. The only, the only one that he will restate is spiritual deception. Uh, now, why does spiritual deception head the list? Why does Jesus come back on several occasions in his sermon? Because all of the signs that he gives of his second coming, of all of those, this is the only sign which will follow us into eternity. If you're killed by an earthquake, that earthquake is not going to follow you into heaven. If you're killed by a famine or war, that famine or war will kill you physically, but the dominion of that ends over your life. That ends at the grave. Spiritual deception is the only thing which will follow you into eternity. If you are deceived by the uh, about the one true God, if you are deceived about the one true Savior, if you're believing in a counterfeit gospel or a counterfeit Bible, these things will not only destroy you in this life, but they will also destroy you in the life to come. And that is why Christ reiterates this point over and over again in the sermon. Christ said earlier that there were going to be wolves which will come and they will have sheep's clothing. And so what he's telling us here is there are going to be bad people who have an intention of taking advantage of you and me, but their appearance is going to be look genuine. Uh, it's a genuine article. They are going to look like the genuine man or woman of God that brings up a problem. If this person who is teaching me the Bible, this person whom I am using as a mentor, this person whom I am using to follow me, follow into the kingdom of God, if there is a, if, if there is that potential that might, that they might be a wolf, and yet Jesus said they will actually look like sheep, well then, how in the world can I tell if the man and woman or woman is a wolf or a sheep? Well, the only thing you have to look at is what, what is their diet? What are they consuming? Sheep do not eat other sheep. Sheep eat pasture. They are not meat eaters. Wolves, on the other hand, they delight in eating sheep. So wolves use sheep. Wolves abuse sheep for their own end. And so you look at this man or this woman and you ask yourself, what are they leaving in their wake? Are they leaving destruction? Are they leaving broken lives? Are they using the flock of God, uh, you know, for their own stepping stone uh, to to uh, to their own perceived greatness? Are they using people, destroying people, hurting people? If the answer is yes, it's likely you're dealing with a wolf. And so Christ says here 
that many will come in my name. Yes, they seem to be anointed. Uh, yes, they're teaching the Bible. But if they are harming the flock of God, uh, they are very bad and you should separate yourself from them. And at this point, people become very critical of the words of Christ. People say, come on, this is vague. You know, this is like reading a horoscope or, uh, you know, we've had many earthquakes. We've had many wars. We've had many famines. What in the world is this guy talking about? Well, notice, let's jump down to verse 8 for a minute. It says all these events are, are the beginning of birth pains. Some of the Bibles might say the beginning of sorrows. Some of the translations, this literally says in the Greek, all of these are birth pains. What are birth pains? Birth pains modulate. The woman's about to give birth. She's plugged up to a monitor and the monitor shows a spike. That's letting you know that there's a contraction taking place. And so the pain intensifies. And then what happens? The pain diminishes. There's a little bit of rest period, a little bit of peace, sometimes minutes, sometimes seconds or sometimes hours. And then another pain comes upon her. This is uh, this time the pain is even more intense. Christ is not saying that there will be no earthquakes until right before he returns, nor is he saying that there will be no wars before he, he arrives the second time. He is saying that there is going to be an increase. There's going to be an, an increase of intensity. There's going to be an increase of frequency to these things. And so there should be no surprise to you and me that there will be an increase in spiritual deception. There should be no surprises that fewer and fewer churches believe in the virgin birth. Fewer and fewer churches believe in the deity of Christ or the word of God as being the standard for the spiritual truth. There are approximately a half a million churches in, in, in the United States. How many of them today do you think you can go to where the person behind the pulpit is saying, let's open up our Bibles and study what God has to say to us? Fewer and fewer. Most churches are governed by the fact that if they do not offer the congregation some form of entertainment, that people are going to leave. The Bible says that there will come a point where there will no longer be an appetite for biblical truth, and we're living today in 2018 in those times right now. All right, notice now in verse number six. Press pause, read verse six. It is likely that he is saying here that the general conditions of the earth from time, from the time that Jesus ascends into heaven until the time Jesus returns again is marked by men either fighting a war or by men talking about starting a war. He is either going to be using a saber on you or he's going to be rattling his saber, threatening to use it on you. Jesus is saying every time that there is an outbreak of one of these things, don't immediately think to yourself, oh, the end is here. Notice that Jesus said, but the end is not yet. Notice that word yet. Does that not confirm that there will be an end? What is going to be an indication of the end? Christ is going to give us the next time uh, that we have a study, this next study in chapter 24, Christ is going to give us that greatest sign, uh, which is right, right around the corner. Now, he is giving us signs of what will happen just before the end. Notice now in verse 7. So press pause, read 7, and then come back. This word nation here, in the Greek, it's the word ethnos. It has, it's the, it's the same word where we get in English the word ethnic. In other words, it is going to be ethnic groups waging war against other ethnic groups. Now, ethnicity has nothing to do with one's race. An ethnic group is a group of people who are surrounding a value system. Uh, they are surrounding what they believe to be the truth. They're surrounding a religion or a culture. We as Christians and Messianic Jews are an ethnic group. Even though we might share different races, yet we are a group of Bible-believing 
Christians and Messianic Jews. We are Christians who believe that the Bible is the standard of truth which was given to us by God. We are an ethnic group, group of believers. When the Muslims blow us up, that is another ethnic group of people. They are a group of people surrounding themselves with another concept. And so when they blow up Christians, that is an ethnic group waging war against another ethnic group. Now, when you have one gang killing another gang in the state of California, that again is an example of what Christ is telling you here. One ethnic group will be rising up against another ethnic group. That's called ethnic cleansing. When we look at history in the mid-1800s, there was the Irish potato famine. That was an ethnic cleansing. That was the British trying to destroy the Irish. In the early 1900s, we had the Armenians beginning be, being destroyed uh, 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 in Turkey. These were Bible-believing Christians who were being destroyed by the Muslims, and the result was two million Christians were killed. Then you have Stalin who killed five million Ukrainians, and who knows how many peasant Russians he killed. The Japanese invasion in China, 300,000 Chinese nationals were killed. Japan, by the way, has never apologized for that. And then we have the Holocaust. Six million Jews were exterminated. Five million Polish were exterminated. Millions of others after World War II, an estimated 82 million people were killed in that World War II conflict. In the 1970s, we had millions killed in Cambodia, Rwanda in 1994, a million were killed. And going into the Sudan, even into current times, over 2 million killed, most of whom were Christians, and another 5 million have been displaced. Now, here is what's interesting. If we take the numbers that history gives us of ethnic cleansing and you put them on a graph, you will clearly see illustrated what Jesus is speaking about here when he talks about uh, birth pains. If you notice that they get closer and closer, they get more intense. And notice that Jesus is uh, says it, it will even uh, be on a larger scale. It will be uh, kingdom against kingdom, huge people groups against other huge people groups. There has been more war and more loss of life in the 20th century than all of the 19th centuries combined before the 20th century. With the rise of nuclear weapons and defense strategies for nuclear weapons being developed, it's not only ruining the resources of people, but it's ruining the resources of, uh, of money as well. Um, this is clearly defining the intensifying of the birth pains which Jesus prophesied. Christ has told us of these things long before they happen. The good news for all believers is that God through his sovereignty has chosen you and me as to where I was going to be born and where and when I was going to be born. He chose you for salvation long before the foundations of the world was established. The world might be quickly going down the drain, but God has chosen you a believer to be here during this time of history, to be a shining light, to lead uh, other people to him, to Jesus, the Messiah. You are the instrument to glorify his name. And thank, thanks be to God, we will be in his presence throughout eternity. All right, that concludes this study, the first eight verses. Uh, we will continue uh, the next study in Matthew chapter 24, verses 9 through 31. Thank you for viewing and good day.